With St. Patrick's Day coming up on the 17th and Greek Independence Day on the 25th, it would be fascinating tonight to take a look at some of the bonds that unite these people. And so, as Americans, we wonder, are there truly ties that connect these nations? We'll find out more about this as we come up with an eye on history. Musical Masterworks, a program dedicated to the rediscovery of great symphonic, instrumental, choral, operatic, cinematic, and electronic compositions from antiquity to the present, with your host, Mike Stratus. And this is your host, Mike Stratus, with a special edition of Eye on History tonight, and we will be looking at some of the interesting things that I tantalized you with in the beginning of tonight's show, and that is basically the connection between Greeks, Irish, and Americans. And of course, to be here on this interesting occasion as a very well-known voice in the studio here at Cosmos FM is Esmeralda Maricas. Good evening, Esmeralda. Good evening, Mike, and it's always a pleasure to be here. And, of course, we know that uh, the topic tonight is a fascinating one. And I want you to respond to this thesis. Science can assist as a proof that prehistoric events, which some have dismissed as fantasy or even myth, were real and provide informative explanations about early human life. What's your take? First of all, geology. And speaking of geology, we need to say that Professor Elias Mariolakos' book is now in print under the title Eleniki Geomythologia, Greek Geomythology. Actually, the presentation took place last Thursday in Athens, and it is the first of four books. If I may just interrupt you, Professor Elias Mariolakos is a very well-known authority on the subject of geomythology. Of course, he is a geologist uh, by profession, and uh, he has done so much work. So I want you to continue from there. Also, the starting of the climate for the last 18,000 years explains why civilization blossomed around the eastern Mediterranean area. The climate there was favorable, while in Europe, north of the Pyrenees and the Alps, it was cold, frigid. Well, there have been there have been ice ages in the past, and mm-hmm. some surprisingly even more recent in times like the 14th century. But you're absolutely right. Mm-hmm. And archaeology also, for instance, archaeological findings in southeastern Sweden and Norway leave no doubt that around 1750 BC, the Greeks were present in the area, and they carried out trade relations with the Northerners whom they called Hyperboreans. And that's a phrase we've heard, the Hyperboreans. I've heard that so many times. But here we have a wonderful, wonderful opinion about the Greeks being there historically as a presence. Continue. And because ancient Greek literature is rich, Greek mythology was preserved. One example is the myth about the big continent west of the big island in the Atlantic. Fascinating. Of course, one question that pops up immediately is, what are your sources? (laughs) Can you specify any sources referring to these things? Absolutely. Plutarch, ethics, ethica. I think they call them moralia. The moralia, Moralia, that's correct, and Plutarch, yeah. Another source is the conversation between Alexander the Great and the Eugenes. Diogenes, yes. And, of course, Plato, Timaeus. 
Another example, the Trojan War. Thanks to Schliemann, we know that the city Troy exists. Yes, that's a very big thing, very big thing. I mean, well, Heracles existed too. I mean, we can say so many of the figures of the past. I mean, if you just take a look at Heracles, uh, known to us more popular as Hercules, the House of Hercules um, is a very important one. It's a family connection with most of the leading royal families of ancient Greece. But most recently, I heard that the House of Heracles was uncovered in Thebes. Mm-hmm. In Theba. And, of course, he's the ancestor of Alexander the Great. Yes, that's Dynastia a big connection. Dynastia Iraklidon, the that's dynasty correct. of Iraklidis. That's right. Much of what we know about the prehistoric world, which was taken as a fact by the ancient Greeks was falsified and rejected in later time. And I think that one good example is the significance of Delphi, the sacred place, Omphalos της Gis. The navel of the earth. The navel of the earth, right. For thousands of years, um, it was a universal religious, political, and cultural center, and an oracle could play a definite role in the evolution of history and civilization. And it is actually the area where the Phcalion and Pira were saved after the flood. Wow. And That's Plutarch amazing. was a high priest there. Let's step back a little for those of you listening. Delphi is this amazing center of uh, religion as well as oracular prophecy. If you read your ancient Greek history, so much of the important events have as a point of reference famous oracles that were pronounced, whether it be in the Persian Wars or the Peloponnesian Wars and so forth, pretty much to the time it was closed down Mm -hmm. in the Roman period. Uh, Let us not also forget that um, there were excavations that were here, if I'm not mistaken, uh, until the, what, 19th century? That is correct, Um, in 1892. And this was forgotten for centuries, uh, if not millennia at this point, a millennium. Um, I just want to mention that the name Delphi just only recently, within the last 130 years, resurrected from the ancient past. So, um, I mean, it's just an amazing thing to think about that. Because the the official line, both religious and political of the Roman and later Eastern Roman Empire, not only shut down the temple, but the entire area became through the years the city of Castri. Right. We, we find the same with Verina, which is mm-hmm. not the real name. It's Eye, yeah, or Palatitia, as they said some people. And actually, the Emperor Theodosius is the one who issued the Edictum in 392 AD. And this was the final strike against the ancient Greek world. Right. And as a result, people through the years forgot everything about their roots. They forgot that they are descendants of Elinas. Lefkalion's son, and nobody else's. So the topic of tonight is ancient Greece, Ireland, and America. We started with the Greeks. How does Ireland fit in? Well, the mythology and in general the prehistory of Ireland was forgotten for two reasons. First, it was not written. And second, it was falsified in the 12th century AD by a text which merged the myths of the ancient Irish people with the Old Testament and it is called Liber Gabala. Liber Gabala, Eren, as some would say fully, but you're, I will, for him here I will call it Liber Gabala, yes. Mm-hmm. But the best source is the Oxford Dictionary of Celtic Mythology. Dr. James McKillop writes about Liber Gabala. Liber Gabala 
is a collection of pseudo-historical texts by various authors of different periods arranged in a pattern of invasions. The Labor Gabala purports to synchronize myths, legends, and genealogies from early Ireland with a framework of biblical exegesis. Another important phrase, Labor Gabala is a masterpiece of muddled medieval miscellany. That's a lot of M's there, a lot of alliteration, mm -hmm. huh? And another <laughs> like one, it. the text begins the story of human history with a biblical flood. Well, the ancient name is Ierni. That is a Greek word for Iera Nisos, that means sacred island. So Ireland's ancient name is Ierni. That's, that's amazing. That it is, is correct. It, it sounds very familiar. Iera Nisos. Right. In the Orphic Argonautica, we can clearly read that name. The boat Argo sailed next to the Ionian Islands. Nin gar ligristi kergaleis kakotitos liksome inisisin iernisin ason iksome. Let's say to save myself from the grievous misfortune, I have to reach quickly the Ionian Islands. Wow. And of course, we don't know if we find the name first in the Orphix, or it was already there before the Orphix. For example, from the time of the prehistoric Minias, the minions, who yes. had traveled there, or even before them. And it looks like it was known under that name before the Argonauts, since, as we already mentioned, findings in southeastern Sweden, which date about 500 years before the Argonauts, prove the presence of prehistoric Aegeans in the area. So the name Ierni, through the years, became Iverni or Iverna. When the English wanted to refer to the ancient Irish, they were using the name Ivernian even in the early 20th century. And by the way, there is a river Ernie in the northwestern Ireland and a lake as well. Wow, and for our Irish friends who are listening, let me just make that connection for you. You've heard the phrase, the ancient order of Hibernians. There is the origin of Hibernian, Ivernian, Ierni. There you have it. Go ahead. Let's refer to the three most important invasions in Ireland. Actually, there were about six, yes. but the three are the most important ones. Right. One was by the Queen Cesara. And according to Labor Gabala, she was a granddaughter of Noah, who went there before the flood because Noah did not want her in the ark. <laughs> Does this make sense? I, I, it really set off a lot of angry women right now, that's for sure. Why would they <laughs> let this woman off the boat? I don't get it. <laughs> it's interesting. Well, something interesting here. Cesara was a queen and a priestess in the temple of Dimitra in the Mount Imitos in, in Attica. Attica. Oh, my God, that's amazing. I, I, that's and she was the daughter of the king Keleos of Eleusis. So she has a Greek origin. Right, and actually, the more ancient name of Eleusis is Caesarea. Remember Caesarianit. Caesarianit, right. Another invasion took place by the Danans, who also invaded the islands around Ireland and also Scotland. And they are mentioned as Tuatha de Danan, and they are considered to be gods. The word Tuatha means race, people, nation. Tribe. Tribe, thank you. De means God. Professor McKillop writes, descended through 11 generations from the Nemedians, the Tuatha de Danan were thought to have come from Greece, but oh. to have learned magic and druid love, dried in remote northern lands. The Druids, wow. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Dryot is an Irish term which defines the rituals of the Druids. So we see here a cultural relation between the Danans and the Druids. And as for Plinius the Older. Pliny the Elder, the Roman uh, 
uh, author who's very famous for his uh, writings, especially at the time of Pompeii, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. First century A.D. Mm -hmm. He writes that the name Druids comes from the word Dris, the oak tree. But besides being priests, they were also philosophers. They were passing on all the necessary knowledge in the form of oral rhymes known as gnomic verses. We have another Greek word here, gnomic, mm. gno, from the verb gnosko. Gnosko. Mm. Gno means so that I know or to know. The uh, Druids believed in the immortality of the soul and in reincarnation. Look at that. A universal faith which was rejected by Pope Vigil in the year 551 AD and the Emperor Justinianos followed shortly after. Now, that's just uh, quite an interesting fact there. I mean, we have heard that in the early church there, were, there was talk of reincarnation, then it suddenly stopped, and I guess here you have it. It stopped. So um, continue, please. As for the sacred oak tree, Dris, it is found in the most ancient temple in Dodoni, and the priests of Zeus, which were called Seli, Seli yeah. or Eli, were giving the oracles from the rustling of the leaves. Um, the Druids also did not have temples. They were holding the rituals in groves or forest clearings. And they were cutting the mistletoe branches only with a golden sickle while other priests were holding a white cloth under the tree in order for the mistletoe not to fall on the ground. And this ritual was done on the sixth day of the new moon, and it was related to fertility rites. And of course, the mistletoe was a holy plant because it was a sign of the presence of the tree deities. So this is why mistletoe is placed above the heads of couples at Christmas time and is followed by kissing with fertility purposes in mind. That is absolutely correct. That's something. The druids are thought to have practiced magic, but this was only to cure illnesses. For instance, they were throwing mistletoe into a pond and preparing the remedies. And of course, that's something that Pliny writes about, right? Pliny is right. Yeah. Let's now go back to the word druid, D-R-U-I-D. There is no word with this root in any language. English, it's oak. French, it's shen. German, it's eiche. But there is a Greek word, dris, mm, oak tree. It. Drimos, the forest. And another word, driades, mentioned as nymphs of the trees, driades or amadriades. And their origin is related to the sacred oak tree, Dris of the Thoni, which is the culture and or even religious link with the um, Argonauts, Heracles, and of course with Apollo and the Hyperboreans. The Driades were four. They were Erato, Figalia, Tithorea, and Evridiki. Orpheus' wife. The wife of Orpheus, yes. And very interesting is what Diodorus Sicilotis mentions. Diodorus of Sicily, the great historian, yes. Mm -hmm. The Celts who were residing close to the Atlantic shore, among their gods, they worshipped more the Oscuri. And Dr. Machilop refers to an altar which was found in the area of Paris where we can see the Dioscuri among other Celtic figures. The Dioscuri are the brothers Castor and Polydevkis, the brothers of uh, Helen and Clytemnestra, mm -hmm. known as the Gemini, right? The Gemini, so right. So we're talking about something like the constellation of Gemini, right? Well, whatever is on earth is a reflection <laughs> of whatever is in heaven. Well said. And uh, let's go now to the third invasion. This was the one by the Milesians. And Leber Gabala tells us that the Milesians are descendants of Mile Spain who migrated to Spain and he is a descendant of Adam and that the word Milesian is the Latinized name of Mile Spain. That's, that's a stretch. And there comes Dr. Makilop again and he writes sources 
outside the Lever Gabala suggests the link with ancient Militos in Asia Minor. That makes sense. Absolutely. So, Lebre Gabala not only ignores the militians, but also the prehistoric Irish who must have had a big civilization. Let's remember the architectural masterpieces in the Orcades. Mm, the Orkneys. Yes, Orkneys. yes. And the megalithic structures in Shetland. The Shetland Islands off the coast there, yeah. And, and those, if I'm not mistaken, are dated, uh, prehistoric um, structures are dated about, what, 4,000 to 2,000 BC in there? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Right. And for sure, Labrigabala tries to exclude mm-hmm. and ignore the presence of prehistoric Aegeans in the area. That is absolutely stunning. For those of you, just a little summary. We've been talking with... Uh, Esmeralda Maricus about this amazing uh, story of how the pseudo history known as the Liber Gabala has suggested certain things it, when separated from the biblical background maintains some kind of a tradition that claims to have some kind of a Greek connection and uh, when you say the invasion of the Milesians and then you have the uh, the second invasion, which you mentioned, was pretty much um, the the Danans. Dana, the, the Danans, the Tuatha de Danan, and of course, Queen Cassara or Cassara. They clearly imply some Greek presence there, and it really is uh, quite a, a, an interesting link with what we know. If we separate clearly the medieval editions, and you could tell the, the stories of Noah and other things are just pretty much supplementing that. Nevertheless, it's truly quite amazing. And one more thing before we go to the news from Greece. Let me just say that um, the letter Y in ancient Greek, when pronounced, is U, correct? Mm-hmm. So D R Y A S, Vrias in modern Greek, is really Druas, correct? It would seem that Dru is Druid, Dryad, Druad. You see a lot of similarities there. Whether that's true or not, we'll leave that to others. But it's a fascinating proposal. And we clearly see the, the cultural relation between the Druids and the Danans. And for me, that's the most important thing now. And I think that's a great statement to make before we go to the news from Greece and community announcements. So we'll be back. And welcome back. Mike Stratus here with Esmeralda Maricus. And uh, tonight's special edition of Eye on History has been focusing on some fascinating uh, historical and, uh, shall I say, geomythological um, conclusions about the relationship between the Greeks, the Irish, and now we're about to move into America. And on the line, direct from Athens, Greece, is our great honor to have Professor Elias Mariolakos. Dr. Mario Lacos is a professor emeritus of the University of Athens, Department of Geology. Uh, he has much to tell us. Uh, professor, are you on the line? Good evening to <laughs> Good evening to you, too. Thank you so much for being Thank here you. with us. I have um, Esmeralda Maricas here next to me. Esmeralda? Good evening, Professor. Good evening, <laughs> Mr. Marik. We've been having a nice uh, little introduction here tonight about some of the main ideas about uh, this geomythological presentation. We'd like to take it from the next level. We've looked at the Greeks, we've looked at the Irish, and now we want you to tell us something about America and the great hero Hercules, Heracles. Heracles, yes. First of all, I would like to underline that... uh, everything uh, which uh, I am going to narrate tonight is actually the text of Plutarch. Right. Plutarch, who lived uh, between 50 and 120 years A.D., right. was one of the most prolific ancient writers known internationally for his two series, The Parallel Lives and Moralia. Yes. Well, in two of his works, that is concerning the face which appears in the orb of the moon and on the obsolescence of oracles, he includes numerous geographical information that allow the modern geographer to realize the following. The geographical knowledge of the Minoans and the Mycenaeans 
that is uh, the people who live here in Greece between uh, three third millennium until the first millennium BC. Yes. Yes. And second, that their knowledge was extending as far as the North Atlantic, known at this time as Cronian Sea. Right, right. So, in this text, which is included in the so-called, uh, in his work, concerning the phase which appears in the orb of the moon, and in the paragraph 941, he is speaking, or better to say, two people are speaking about a journey which uh, uh, goes from Great Britain to the west, northwest and west. And, uh, well, what I am uh, now narrating uh, is not uh, a text from my fantasy, yes? No, uh, no, no. <laughs> but it is written. Right. So, in this text we can read I'm seeing the text better in order to avoid any mistake, because it is very, very important. So, he says, Enail Ogigia, Ogigia right. lies far out at sea, a run of five days off from Britain as you sail westward. What means this one? Based on the description, the distance between Britain and the island of Yeya has been estimated between 800 and 1,335 kilometers. Yes? Yes. If the velocity of sailing vessel is uh, about 4 miles per hour or 5 or six miles per hour. Right. According to these, Ogilia is the present day Iceland. Wow. <laughs> That's there amazing. is no other there is no other island westward That's right. of Britain in this distance. Right. Yes? That's correct. And he continues Plutarch, three other islands equally distant from it and from one another lie out from it in the general direction of the summer sunset. Well, we have what he says, that there exist three other islands west from Ogilia, that means from Iceland. In my opinion, if Ogilia is Iceland, then the three islands located to the west must be Greenland, Newfoundland and Baffin Island. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly yes. right. Yes, that is the geographical distance, and uh, yes, that makes a lot of sense. If, if, yeah, if, if you have in, in front of us an atlas and a geographic atlas, then there is, there is no other big uh, islands which lies in the same distance Correct. from from, uh, from, Otigia, from, from, uh, from Iceland. And, Professor, if I may ask you, would it not make sense that in the ancient period, even the prehistoric period, that people would always sail at the shoreline level to make sure they could determine the coasts and to determine the landmass that they're sailing past? Yes, you are right. Okay. The question is not where did they have all this experience? Yes? Right. But if we read Homer, then we will see that uh, the god uh, Ocean, okay, the Titan Ocean, right. yes, has studied the physical oceanographical characteristic of the Atlantic Ocean. Right. They knew exactly the route of the Gulf Stream. That's correct. For example. That's correct. Yes? Yes. It is well known to us, geoscientists. Well, then... Uh, in other words, uh, the Cronian Sea must be the North Atlantic. Okay? And then he continues, and he writes, the great mainland, that is the great continent, 
by which the great ocean is encircled, while not so far from the other islands, that means that there exists a great continent yeah. which encircled the sea. If we have in mind the coast of the North America, then we see that this mainland, this Greenland, encircle the great sea. That means uh, the ocean. Right. And he writes further. On the coast of the mainland, Greeks dwell, Greeks live, about a gulf, which is not smaller than the Meotis right. Azovic. Meotis is Azov. Azovic Lake. Sea of Azov, right? And lies on the same line as the mouth of the Caspian Sea. That is, the, in this main, in this mainland, in this great continent, yes? Yes. There exists a gulf, which is not smaller than Meotis, and lies in the same line as the entrance of the Caspian Sea. Mm. If we have in mind where uh, Caspian Sea is located, then we see that there in towards west there exists no other Gulf than the St. Lawrence Gulf. That's correct. Yes. Yes. I'm looking if, at the if, map, if, Professor. I'm looking at the map right now, yes. and the parallel is pretty exact. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's exactly the same. Right. Thing. It's the yeah. Bay of Fundy and uh, the area yeah. that's located there, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, there, in the coast of this gulf... Uh, right, this gulf. Greeks lived. Yes, it is written there, yes. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm reading Plutarch. the text, exactly the translation of the text, yes. Right. With the people of Cronus... They are mingled uh, at a later time those who arrived uh, in the train of Heracles. That is, uh, that means that uh, Hercules or Heracles arrived later on, for sure. Why? Because Cronus uh, has visited the area uh, much earlier. Yeah, the Cronus, right. the Titan, right, Titans, and were left behind by him, and that these latter, so to speak, rekindle again to a strong high flame of Hellenic spark there, which was already being quenched and overcome by the tongue, the laws, and the manners of the barbarians. Right. Therefore, Heracles has the highest honors, and Cronus the second. The question is, which were the people of Cronus? Right. Another question is, where where they located, and uh, which is the area where the high flame of the Hellenic spark was quenched. And if we go further, we can uh, see that uh, he writes, but those who survived the voyage first put in the outlying island, which are inhabited by Greeks, and see the sun pass out of sight for less than an hour over a period of 30 days. Well, here is exactly located the area where these Greeks lived on that time. Right. They lived on an area where uh, they see the sun pass out of sight for less than an hour over a period of 30 days. Wow. Well, it is a little bit south of the Arctic Circle. The yeah? Arctic Circle, that's correct. The North Pole. Yeah. That is uh, somewhere between Newfoundland and uh, the Arctic Circle. Right, Yes. right. Maybe on the north side of the St. Lawrence Gulf. Right. Yes. Well... This is, an, uh, in my opinion, an, uh, a proof that uh, the ancient Greeks 
they arrived on the northern part of the North American area. Right, the northeastern section of the continent. Professor, if I may ask you, um, time-wise, since we are mentioning very well-known names like Heracles and uh, yes. events that are connected with that, would we be safe in saying that it, it's a Bronze Age or early Bronze Age possibility? That this t- no, no. It, uh, it is following. Her- we know uh, exactly now that uh, Hercules or Heracles lived uh, at the beginning of the third. Uh, 13th century B.C., sometimes, let's say, uh, around 50 years uh, before the Trojan Trojan War. That's correct, yes. Somewhere there, yes, not exactly, but anywhere. Right. The question is, when uh, Cronus went there, why? Because Cronus was exiled by Zeus. Right, by Zeus, that's right. By Zeus. The question is, when... Zeus exiled uh, Cronus. Right. And another question is, when was it was possible to arrive there in the sea because of the climatic conditions? Right. Right. That's right. Why? Because, as we all know, the climate uh, is uh, changing uh, periodi- periodically. Periodically. Yes? That's right. That's correct. Periodically. Even as we speak. In other <laughs> In other words, when it was uh, 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 easy to arrive a ship uh, of that time in this northern part of of our uh, globe, in uh, in my opinion, uh, this could happen uh, not earlier than the fourth millennium BC. Wow! Why? Because the the streams, the Gulf Stream, or better to say, the present day Gulf Stream, right. uh, arrived on that northern part, on this northern part, around the fourth millennium BC. Right. So, the question is, when Zeus now uh, exiled uh, uh, Cronus? In this uh, in this area, well, this is difficult to answer. Yes, yes. very. But uh, I would like to give an answer in connection with another question: Why did uh, Hercules and Cronus uh, decided to come up to there? That's right. Yes? That's a good question. Why? What is the reason? For traveling, for touristic, or as a tourist, <laughs> or, in my opinion, it has to do with the copper mines ah. and the copper of the Michigan. Ah, that that makes a lot of sense, Professor. There's yes. always a resource, a precious resource. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and and Hercules also. So the question: Why did uh, Cronus uh, uh, with his people and later Hercules with his uh, people go there. Unfortunately, neither Plutarch nor any other ancient author answer to above question. Right. The answer, in my opinion, consequently, is hidden in the archaeological excavations that have been carried out until recently on Royal Island in Lake Superior. Wow, Royal Island. Keep an eye on that. That's a good one to check out. Royal Island, Lake Superior. Gotcha. Yes. It is well known, the all bearing area of Sudbury of Canada. Right. It is well known. Yes, right, always. right. That's correct. The all bearing area around Superior Lake oh, and on the Isle Royal in Michigan State and elsewhere around it are also well known. The the American uh, geologists uh, have found more than 10,000 places of mining activity which have been located on this area. That's amazing. That's amazing. Wow. And more, more than 500,000 tons of native copper were mined there. That, 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 the question yeah. is, 
Yes, please. Yes, that it just raises so many motives that, you know, we know in our times that some of the leading reasons why imperialism broke out in the 18th century, in 19th century, was to get resources. So it sounds like more of the same initiatives, more of the same motives to get resources. And this makes a lot of sense. It's very reasonable, Professor. Yes, and the most important is that uh, this mining activity took place between 2,450 and 1,050 B.C. Wow. And they stopped. Wow. Suddenly like that. Professor, we're coming near the end of the program here. There's so much we could talk about. I, I have to tell you, I would love to have you back one day and continue this yes. conversation. I have to tell you, everyone who's listening here is totally with their mouth open listening, and uh, we really thank you for your time. We hope, uh, the name of the book, one more time, for those who are listening. Yes, Greek Geomythology. Greek Geomythology. And Elinki Geomythology. Very good. And it's now available, correct? It takes, it, yeah, yes, it takes uh, in account the geo-environmental uh, conditions of that old time. Okay, definitely. Everybody listening, please make sure you get a chance to get this book. Geomythology is absolutely something to take a look at. Uh, I would have to tell you, Professor, a big thank you on behalf of Cosmos FM for spending time with us and explaining these ideas. And thank you also. My pleasure. You have a wonderful night, and we'll talk again. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Thank you, too. Have a great night. Bye-bye. 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 A wonderful night has come to a close. This is Mike Stratus on a special edition of Musical Masterworks, Ion History, with uh, Professor Elias Mariolacos. Uh, I want to thank uh, Esmeralda once again for being here. Esmeralda Maricas, thank you. pleasure is all mine. Thank you for inviting me, Michael. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this. And so if you have any questions uh, about tonight's program, you can call 718-204-8900. I'll be back in two weeks. Until then, check out Greek Geomythology. Bye-bye.